Hello! I'm here today to talk about my top three favorite references I found in House of Leaves. I was gonna go through and talk about every reference I found in House of Leaves, um, but those videos, to be honest, were a pain to film and edit, um, so I just decided to go with like the top three. They're in no particular order, just as they are. Uh, so first reference is the dot. Yes, a single dot on page 312. Um, and I wrote, I think, the most on this page out of um, all the pages. Um, so there are multiple things that the simple mark could be referencing. So first of all, James Joyce, Ulysses. He wanted to include a big dot in Ulysses. Um, it's found at the end of the Ethica episode. And there are many theories as to what this could mean in Ulysses. Um, so I'm only going to cite the ones that are relevant to House of Leaves. Okay. So first of all, it could signify Bloom leaving consciousness. So in House of Leaves, this is the end of the Navitan tape and alludes to the end of Navitan himself. You know, he has enough food and water for three days, we're told, and then we get the dot. The next time we see Navitan, he's in like a dreamlike state. The host has completely given up on earthly physics and Navitan is in a full-blown nightmare. Um, we see that happen in Ulysses as well as Bloom, um, you know, navigates consciousness and unconsciousness. This also gives great credence to the theory that the house itself reflects the unconscious psychology of the residents, um, Navitan in particular. Number two, <laughs> the dot reduces written language to its constituent elements of black figure on white ground dissolving the convention of the alphabet. Um, so <laughs> this is very fitting for the book as it plays with the words on the page um, in House of Leaves, right? So maybe the dot is there to reassure readers that this is just words on a page. You know, this is not something to actually fear or believe in or to analyze too much. Um, these words are just black marks on a white page and without context they are meaningless. It is us bringing meaning and uh, reality as readers to the text um, and MZD is trying to stop us, remind us that this book is supposed to be fun, um, not just, you know, a nightmare and something to analyze and poke at. We're supposed to have fun with it. The third um, meaning of the dot could possibly be um, a question. Is it a stop uh, on the page or is it an opening through the page? A punct as seen in Finnegan's Wake or a puncture? So we've seen wax kick a hole in the house and the hole appearing in the text so this wouldn't be something that MZD hasn't done before. Perhaps the dot is similar to that. Um, you know, it's another window into the text, a kind of peephole into a door as to what comes next. We are peering through a peephole into the house and we aren't getting the whole story, only what we can see and it's probably distorted as well as, you know, if you look through a peephole in a door, it often distorts things. It's also a call for us to look back and reflect on what we've seen as it's on the back of a page as opposed to the front of the page of a page. So, you know, calling us to reflect. Possible meaning uh, could be QED, um, make marking, which marks the end of a, a logical argument. You know, it's Latin for uh, quad erit demonstratum. Excuse my Latin. I only have one tongue, as Johnny says, uh, which literally means what was to be shown. It's used at the end of mathematical proofs or philosophical arguments to indicate the argument is complete. It's done. Uh, but this happens in the middle of the book, um, just 42 pages off from the exact middle, actually. Um, so I thought that was interesting. 42, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. <clears throat> Probably irrelevant, but still fun. In philosophy, QED can also mark the solution to a syllogism, an argument in which the third part um, connects the first two parts. So this could maybe imply that um, one character um, connects two other characters in the House of Leaves. So this calls into question Johnny's paternity, which is a common theme throughout House of Leaves discussions. Um, so he could connect Pelafina and Zampano, um, and we already have evidence that Pelafina knows Zampano. Um, you can also look further at the parallels between Ulysses and House of Leaves for a possible answer. So if we correlate Bloom, someone who has lost a son and is looking for a replacement, with Zampano, my dear Zampano, who have you lost, the son he wanted to create, and Stephen with Johnny as a replacement son or a created son. Another interesting point is that 
the dot in Ulysses was first reduced by Joyce's publishers, and then it was missing in some editions. The American Random House edition didn't actually include it until 1961, and it's still not included in some editions. And the Chinese translation has the dot as big O instead. So, and the dot in the Swedish uh, translation is apparently 7.5 centimeters across, so it's quite a large dot. This also calls attention to the publication of the book. House of Lees likes to remind us that we are reading a book. Um, you know, it's not just a story to be submerged in. We are constantly removed from the story minded. You know, this is a text that you are reading. And this ties in with the interesting publication of um, House of Leaves. So MZD had or arguably took <laughs> uh, more control than most authors over the publication aspect of his book, but there are still typos, interesting marks, or straight up mistakes in different editions of the book. It could also be MZD reclaiming ownership over the whole thing, something that Joyce wanted to but ultimately didn't have as evidenced by the different publications, including the dot, not including the dot, reducing the size of the dot, or such. Another interesting point is that the dot in Ulysses and the size of it may have been affected by Joyce's failing vision. You know, he's a blind poet, although I do hesitate to call Joyce a poet because his poems are just awful. Anyways, so perhaps a blind writer. And who do we know in House of Leaves that's a blind writer? Zampano. Um, so that could be a possible little parallel there. Um, also in Ulysses, this signifies the end of Bloom and Stephen's perspective and the shift to the feminine. The next chapter is the Penelope episode and it's from Molly's perspective. So in House of Leaves, the story also shifts at this point to include more of Karen's involvement. We see Navidson um, in the dark and it is up to Karen now to carry on the narrative. She actually takes over editing and producing the, the film. And it's also to her to, to rescue him. Although fittingly for a Joycean work, Karen is either viewed through the male lens or primarily concerned with men. Uh, she does not pass the Bechdel test, is basically what I'm saying there, which is something similar to what we'd see in Joyce's works in personal philosophy. The last connection to Ulysses is that there may be multiple interpretations for this simple marking. You know, we could argue that the difficulty in nailing down one interpretation of something as simple as a dot on a page is what makes both House of Leaves and Ulysses ergodic literature. It is ultimately up to us to, and our own personal experiences, our own levels of engagement that affect how we interact with the text. To some readers, it's simply just a full stop on a page at the end of a sentence. To others, it's a reference to Ulysses. And to others, they may see it as some of these other <laughs> references. Yes, I'm going to continue on talking about the dot. Um, the simplest meaning behind the dot could be that it is a full stop, a period, at the end of a sentence um, that was found on the previous page. Okay? The next simplest meaning is that it is an endnote reference. Um, so we know we have different markings throughout that refer to footnotes, but this could be a reference to an endnote. And on the last page, um, 709, we have the Yggdrasil poem. There's a big dot on that page, um, so it could be a reference to that. Another interesting thing, it could be a reference to the black spot found in pirate stories wherein a crew provided their captain with a page marked with a black spot pronouncing them guilty of some crime and, in, and then instigating a mutiny. And this could be a black spot given to Navidson, uh, signifying that he is no longer in control of the house. The following chapter heavily features Holloway, who was in a power struggle with Navidson. The black spot could signify the shift in power as the Minotaur. Um, the title of the next chapter comes to loom over the house. It's also interesting to note that in Treasure Island, the black spot was on a page from the Bible. On the back of the of the, that page was a quote from the Book of Revelations, um, chapter 22, verses 14 to 15. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city, for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So that tree of life uh, is interesting, also in regards to the Yggdrasil and the whole um, references to trees throughout <laughs> as well. So we have a reference to a significant religious tree, much like Yggdrasil, and a warning that outside the walls of paradise, if you see pages 550 of HOL, um, House of Leaves, sorry, <laughs> my short, short terms are mentioned coming in, um, outside the Walls of Paradise, page 550, are people who lie about being um, in love. A huge theme in um, House of Leaves. And uh, yet another possible reference for that dot um, could be from The Lottery by Shirley Jackson, in which a black dot on a piece of paper is given to the annual victim of the ritual human sacrifice. 
spoilers she said that before <laughs> um and this ties in with the whole minotaur labyrinth thing um as well in which the minotaur was placated with human sacrifices so Navitzin could be seen as a sacrifice to the house or the reader could be a sacrifice to the house of course um he lives um after being rescued by his own theseus karen so um the last thing possibly that the dot could be is a marking to indicate that you are here um normally those darts no, normally those dots are red, but the next chapter is the Mentor, which is written in red ink. So maybe there's something there. Okay. The second reference is errors. Um, in general, errors, mistakes, things wrong with the text, um, and we are going to talk about references and not just the mistakes in the text. So. We are told in the beginning, in the intro, that errors are significant and to keep an eye out for them. Um, on page 31, Johnny writes, But I've come to believe errors, especially written errors, are often the only markers left by solitary life. So we're called, our attention's called to it right away. And there's lots of errors in House of Leaves. Um, whether purposeful spelling errors, um, for example, Pisces instead of pieces, uh, or possible printing errors, my text had empty boxes found on page 359 that looked like a text error or something had gone wrong. They all add an element to the book and our reading of it. Maybe <laughs> these could be another method of pulling us out of the text and showing us that we are reading a book. It's a bit jarring to be going along with the rhythm of the story and then coming across a spelling error. Um, there could also be a way to subtly call our attention to different things. So for example, returning to the Pisces pieces um, issue, Zampano spells the word wrong on page 41, and the same mistake is made by Pelfina on page 599. I find myself asking if mistakenly spelling pieces as Pisces is common, or if this is a clue that somehow links Pelfina and Zampano in some way. Also, things that seem like errors may just be further references to something. For example, on page 61, um, we get reference to a red a Kai, K-Y-E, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, which we can initially think means red key, um, but a Kai is also Middle English and is the plural of cows. And a red Kai, or a red cow, a red heifer in specific, um, is referenced in the Bible in the Book of Numbers, and it's used in a ritual to purify those who have touched a corpse. So death, um, the keys mentioned, is going to a deadlock. Um, it could mean something, who knows. The red cow also holds significant meaning in Jewish tradition due to its extreme rarity of the animal and the detailed ritual. It is cited as the paradigm of a hawk, um, a biblical law for which there is no parent logic. Uh, so maybe there is no logic in House of Keys and all my time spent trying to understand it is it's wasted. So I can't believe I didn't think about this until after I had turned off the camera already. And red cow, red bull, minotaur, the writing is in red. So maybe that little mistake, that little error, is possibly more significant than we would think of. Um, and errors may have done on purpose. Um, so for example, Johnny's use of could of instead of could have, or a lot without the space. Um, now none of these are actual references, so let me get to those. Uh, on page 366, we get the German phrase, Nicht also glatt und Gelkenstelt, um, which is translated uh, for us as not overly polished or artificial, and we could just take it as that. Um, but this is actually taken from an essay written by Borges, who we already know MCD likes to cite a lot. Um, and this essay is called Shakespeare Memory, and it uses this German phrase in this specific context. <laughs> I wrote down another discovery. Shakespeare's apparent mistakes those absence dans l'amphi that Hugo apologetically mentions were deliberate. Shakespeare tolerated them or weaved them into his plays so that his discourse, destined to the stage, would seem spontaneous and I'll say it in English because my German pronunciation is probably nein good, um, not too polished and artificial and he uses the German phrase there. So you know this could possibly be another allusion to um, the motivation behind the errors um, to make Hazel Lee's feel more organic, spontaneous, not too polished and artificial. We get another allusion to error in the uh, index um, titled Bits on page 547 in the Red Crossed Out section dated April 3rd, 1995. Zampano writes, I don't think I've ever 
quite equaled the bald gnome error, who comes from his cave with featherless ankles to feast on the mighty dead. And the bald gnome error is referring to a book by Harold Bloom called The Anxiety of Influence, A Theory of Poetry, um, and in it he writes, Among cases of anxiety, Freud finds the class of the uncanny, in which the anxiety can be shown to come from something repressed which recurs. But this unhomely might as well be the homely, he observes, for this uncanny is in reality nothing new or foreign, but something familiar and old established in the mind that has been estranged only by the process of repression. Critics in their secret hearts love continuities, but he who lives with continuity alone cannot be a poet. The god of poets is not Apollo, who lives in rhythm of recurrence, but the bald gnome error, who lives at the back of the cave and skulks forth only at irregular intervals to feast upon the mighty dead in the dark of the moon. Hermes ages into a bald gnome, calls himself error. The largest error we can hope to meet and make is every Ephebes fantasia. Quest antithetically enough and live to beget yourself. So this book is all about discontinuity. Um, our reading of it can never really be continuous. The footnotes, page layouts are all designed to disrupt or discontinue our reading. Even if a reader chooses not to read the footnotes, the reading is still interrupted by having to skip over pages of footnotes to find the continuation of the Zampano text. We get a whole chapter on anxiety, this idea of unhomely, um, un not at home or unheimlich um, in House of Leaves. So I believe this passage is very relevant to our reading. Um, so, what is being repressed in House of Leaves? We can talk about what the characters are repressing, you know, Johnny's childhood traumas, Will and Delisle are a few examples. But what about the text itself? The old, established, and familiar is being repressed. This is a book which a lot of us consider, you know, homely, something that we're familiar and comfortable with. Um, but that old, established, and familiar feeling of a book is being repressed in the text. This is not a book that is going to make you feel at home and comfortable, at least on the first read. <laughs> this book represses normalized styles of writing, you know, not just the novel, not just novel formatting, but academic writing, you know, for example, with a mixture of real and fictional sources. You know, there's also a bit of meta-ness um, here, as the title of Bloom's work is The Anxiety of Influence, and how new poets must feast on the mighty dead, the poets that came before them but also create something new. So Bloom says poetry is property in that renaming something gives you ownership over it. So here I am talking about all these references <laughs> to other works in this new work. MZD has created something entirely new, but on top of something older. Recurrence is also something that we see happening in House of Leaves, recurring errors, misspelled words that I mentioned before, uh, recurring references in Zampano, Pelophena and Johnny's writings to Greek mythology, specifically Eurydice, um, Orpheus and Hermes, who is the bald gnome heir. Um, recursion as in a mirror, the book reflects what the reader wants to see. This is the house reflects the thoughts of those in it. Um, if we want to believe the story is a certain way, then that's what we see in the text. Hermes, the predecessor or rather younger version of error, was a god of messages. Um, he was expected to deliver he was expected to deliver messages as they were given. However, along comes error to disrupt or discontinue those messages. So could Johnny and Zampano be Hermes and error? Or vice versa, um, although Johnny is younger, he comes after Zampano's texts and is the one editing Zampano's words like error would be editing Hermes' works. Also mentioned in Bloom's work as um, Apophrates, or the final stage of becoming a poet, contains the uncanny effect that the new poem's achievements make it seem to us not as though the precursor were writing it, but as though the later poet himself had written the precursor's characteristic work. So who really wrote House of Leaves? Was it Johnny Zampano? Was it Pelofino? Or dare I say, was it Mark Z. Danilovsky himself who wrote it? There is a lot to say about errors and mistakes in House of Leaves. However, let's move on to the last reference. Uh, one of my favorites uh, that I found, um, shells. Yes, shells. Seashells and snail shells or sea snail shells, those kind of things. So the first reference we get to shells doesn't seem obvious until it's pointed out. Um, the cover of the book, the supposed staircase mimics a shell. I say supposed staircase because I have another theory that the circle on the cover is actually the dome of a roof, um, but I won't go into that theory here. I'll actually refer you to the video I did on the Grand Staircase. 
So seashells are listed as one of the items in Zimpano's room in the introduction, so immediately I thought, okay, this is something to keep an eye out for. Um, however, aside from some sunflower shells and artillery shells, seashells are not mentioned for another 400 pages. Um, when we get told about Natsun's dream, where he finds himself in a village that worships and needs a giant snail. And he climbs inside its enormous shell there. There's plenty of overwrought analysis um, in the chapter itself about the dream, so I'm not going to be uh, talking about that, but there are some pretty cool references within the chapter itself. First we get a reference to Dr. Doolittle. Uh, it's a movie from 1967 in which Dr. Doolittle and his gang are shipwrecked and get rescued by a giant pink seashell and they ride in his shell and back to England and you know saves the day. It's just something fun and cute there. Um, so we see here the first allusion to shells being a rescue vehicle um, and that motif arguably continues. Um, we can say that in his dream the snail is used to nourish a town, also possibly saving it from starvation. Uh, we are told a few pages later that in general shells are sublime subjects of contemplation for the mind and how shells are houses. Um, construction, repair, and maintenance by the builder require energy and time. The same cunnances used for other life functions as feeding, locomotion, and reproduction. The energy and time invested in shells depend on the supply of raw materials. So not only are shells houses and fit into the general architectural theory found in other references in House of Leaves that houses are best defined um, or made by what inhabits them, but they're also very reflective of the mind. And these all make sense. Um, as references when we consider footnote 382 which talks about the Kitawans of the South Pacific and the Nautilus Pompolis. This is a reference to a treatise by Giancarlo M. Scoditti um, called A Linguistic and Aesthetic Analysis of Visual Art in Melanesia. Yes, and it he writes about the perfection of the Nautilus Pompolis and the effect it had on the art um, and language of the indigenous population of Melanesia. Um, a selection from his writings that I feel have an impact um, on our reading puzzle leaves um, are right now. The Nautilus Pompilius is an example of the concept of perfection accomplished in nature. By choosing the Nautilus Pompilius as a symbol of imagination and the ability to produce concept, the cover makes man and nature equal. So this concept of perfection is something each of our primary characters deal with, and their lack of perfection, because nobody really can be perfect, is what ruins them. Navidson can't decide whether to be a perfect husband or the perfect photographer. I mean, he saw what trying to be that led to with Delisle. Zampano is trying to write the perfect analysis, but to be honest, his work is messy and incoherent at best. Um, and Johnny wanted to be the perfect son, but you can never be perfect or close to it for a narcissistic parent like Pelafina. Another quote, uh, the process of growth of a nautilus is judged to be similar to the process by means of which a man produces concepts and nonverbal signs. That is, a concept develops from a given point and grows just like a nautilus. And so this is how I imagined House of Leaves came to MZD. Um, it started at one point and it's kind of like spiraling around itself. It also reflects the house just constantly building upon itself and feeding off the mental state of those who enter it. Another quote. The Nautilus Pompilius characteristic of preserving its form unaltered thus expresses a value of norm and also symbolizes unalterability. At the same time, the asymmetry of the growth of the Nautilus Pompilius introduces alongside the principle of rigidity in the formal structure that of dynamism. This concept of norm versus dynamism is a description of House of Leaves. We can explain it as a straightforward, normal, haunted house story, but its growth and constant analysis by both fictional characters and real-world readers creates a more dynamic story. Another quote. The importance attributed to the doka on the formal level execution of a perfect curvature has a synchronic counterpoint on the content plane. The carver must express to the outside world an ensemble of principles that enclose aesthetic philosophy of the group to which he belongs, such as the principle of harmony. Nautilius Pompilius expresses this principle just because its worlds are progressive additions to an initial point and respect the latter's structural form. So it is the role of the creator, whether it be a carver or an author, to reflect their philosophy and or the philosophy of those they wish to represent in their work. So we ask ourselves now what aesthetic philosophy did MZD wish for House of Leaves to reflect? 
um, and we could be here for hours discussing that and perhaps even arguing about it, um, about the philosophical intent behind House of Leaves. Um, so we'll just leave that to the comment section uh, down below. Um, we also get a reference to a poem um, in House of Leaves by a Rene Rockier um, about a giant snail. And there's a translation in the text, but I actually prefer the translation um, that Bachelard provides himself. So the the text in House of Leaves is um, pulled from Bachelard's um, text, but the translation isn't. It's just the French that you're given. Um, but I'm going to read Bachelard's translation instead of the editor's translation. It is a giant snail descending the mountain with at its side the brook's white foam. Very old, only one horn left, was, which is its short square belfry. The poet adds, le château et sa coquille, the manor house is its shell. The importance of shells is driven home in the story of the dying baby at the end of House of Leaves. MCV writes, his tiny fingers curled like seashells still daring to clutch a world. The human as the shell clutching at the world, slipping through a grasp, we are the child. Um, our experience as readers coming to an end, we are still trying to derive meaning from whatever we just witnessed. Um, so all of these are a great demonstration of how further looking to the references can give us more to ponder about House of Leaves. I would say help us better understand <laughs> the book, but I honestly think that um, it probably just made it more confusing for me. Um, adding layer upon layer upon layer of all these things, I can't help but think that MZD is just sitting there laughing at us, tearing apart his book looking for meaning, as a large chunk of the book is him satirizing, you know, the overwrought academic analysis of the Navison record. Um, so ultimately, it's meaningless and pointless what we're doing, but it's still fun. I think that's the point. Um, let me know what your favorite reference is in House of Leaves, and thank you for watching.